Onions, carrots, squash, tangerines, you plant a seed, you water it, it grows into a plant. It's that simple, right? Not really. This bounty wouldn't be here if not for the meticulous labor of thousands of tiny workers. They're bees, and without these prolific pollinators, your local farmer's market would be a very different place. About 50% of our vitamin C comes from pollinator-dependent plants. I mean, I don't like the idea of not having watermelon, for example, or not having almonds or kiwi fruit. It seems as if bees are everywhere. The earth is home to more than 20,000 species of them. But farmers rely on only one species, honeybees, to do the heavy lifting of pollination. Many animals are pollinators. Butterflies, bats, and various bees all do it. But honeybees, which organize in easy-to-transport colonies, are the best resource for farmers who need to pollinate large fields in a short time. As they forage for pollen to feed their brood, they unintentionally move some pollen from the male to the female parts of a flower. That forms seeds that grow into everything from almonds to apples. Honeybees are very good pollinators because we can build up big populations when we need them and we're able to move them in and out of crops very quickly. In the fall of 2006, this process was interrupted when honeybees began to die in mass. Researchers labeled the phenomenon colony collapse disorder, or CCD. Colony collapse disorder apparently became first recognized in October of 2006 when a Pennsylvania beekeeper noticed that his bees weren't doing so well in Pennsylvania and then found out they weren't doing so well in Florida or the Dakotas either. Maybe 50% of the beekeepers saw some increase in winter loss that they had not anticipated. Not all the answers are known yet, but a U.S. Department of Agriculture panel found that poor nutrition, pesticides, a lack of genetic diversity, and parasites all contributed to this episode of colony collapse disorder. In California, the abrupt decline in honeybees threatened $6 billion worth of crops. In response, farmers turned to the beekeeping industry, which trucked 700,000 honeybee colonies from around the country into California in the early spring of 2007. So far, it looks as if the measure's been successful, but this is just a stopgap. Bay Area researchers like bee breeder Susan Kobe are working on longer-term solutions. Kobe wants to design a better bee. The main focus of my work is stock improvement. So I'll be working very directly with the commercial queen producers to help them improve their stock. General performance is, is the first criteria. You have to have a good productive bee to be accepted by the uh, industry. But at the same time, we want bees that are re resistant to pests and diseases, especially varroa mite. The varroa mite is a tiny bug that feeds off of bee larvae and infects them with viruses. You get bees that are very weak. There's a disease called deformed wing virus where the wings don't form properly and the bees can't fly, so they're pretty much useless. Creating a bee that can resist varroa mite is no simple task. To breed bees with a specific trait like this, Kobe first had to understand the bees' mating rituals. This is a drone, which is the male honeybee. He's much larger, mostly eyes and abdomen. These drones have a single goal in mind, to mate. In doing so, they give their lives to perpetuate the colony. Okay, here's a drone. I'm gonna avert the drone. That one just popped, he's very mature. When they're really mature like that, if you just stimulate them a little bit, they just avert, they just pop. Those little orange claspers, they, uh, they fit in pockets on, on the sides of the queen, and that just holds them there, and then the endophallus actually turns inside out. It's just a kind of an explosive action, then, he, then he, uh, he'll leave his, his drone parts in the queen, and then he'll fall back paralyzed and die. The rest of the body just falls off. Perhaps over generations, these valiant efforts could lead to a better bee. But Kobe is in a bit of a rush. She's one of only two bee breeders in the United States who performs artificial insemination on queen bees. Here's the queen. She has a name tag on. Kobe chooses queen bees that display traits she wants her designer bees to have. 
The colonies that seem to maintain the varroa mite at lower levels are the queen mothers I'm going to select for. Spore queen. As for the sperm, Kobe has recently started to import some from Europe to increase her stock's genetic diversity. I think we've lost a lot of our genetic diversity in the U.S. due to colonies um, dying from just parasitic mites problems, the CCD, colony collapse disorder, and also the, the small gene pool that the commercial queen producers use to repopulate um, the U.S. colonies. Improving honeybees is one way to go, but why can't farmers press other kinds of bees into service as well? Honeybees, which originated in Europe and Africa, are relatively recent arrivals to the U.S. UC Berkeley biologist Claire Kremen works with native bees, which have been pollinating California's fields for hundreds of years. It used to be that we didn't need to manage pollination at all. Um, farmers had relatively small farm fields and they grew a diverse set of crops and they relied exclusively on the bees that were free living in the environment. Now we have much larger farm fields and generally each field is growing a single crop and those conditions aren't very good for native bees. Native bees might come to the field when it's flowering but when it's not flowering, which is most of the year, there are no resources there for the native bees. By planting some bee-friendly vegetation in their fields, farmers can lure the native bees to come work for them. Native pollinators can benefit farmers really as their backup plan. Farmers that have a diverse community of wild bees are going to be better off. They're going to get some or all of their pollination met needs met by these wild bees. When native bees fly into a field, they motivate honeybees to work more. We've actually been able to document that the honeybees become five times more efficient when there's a lot of native bees around. Some of the male native bees are looking for mates and they're basically investigating everything. And as they do this, they're causing the honeybees to move again. For a plant, it takes more than one pollen grain to make a fruit. And in fact, the more pollen, the better the quality of the fruit. Plants don't make fruits for our benefit. They're really creating fruits like this to disperse their seeds. And a watermelon can have about 300 seeds in there. Some of these look like they actually haven't been fully pollinated, but the black ones are nice, big, healthy seeds. So when the bee lands on the flower, then some pollen that's on the bee will drop off onto the stigma of the flower. It's very important in the case of a watermelon flower that there's enough pollen deposited and also that it's evenly distributed over the whole stigma. And that's what happens through multiple visits by these bees during the course of the day. Each of these seeds results from a pollen grain landing on the flower and growing a pollen tube down until it meets the ovule and fertilizing that ovule to produce the seed. So if part of the flower doesn't receive any pollen, you would get a deformed fruit, which farmers just throw those out. They don't, they don't bring those to market. Near Davis, Kremen has partnered with Audubon California and the Xerces Society, a nonprofit that promotes pollinators. Xerces director Scott Black is visiting farmer Bruce Rominger in Winters, California. They're checking the seedlings that Audubon recently planted next to Rominger's field. Their blooms will draw native bees to pollinate the field. Willows, yeah. And the willows are great early season. Yeah, a bunch of the wild roses. Early season plants. and, and The farmers are often interested in doing habitat restoration, particularly along drainage ditches. In part, this is to manage water and prevent soil erosion on their farms. And they can buy into some of these farm bill programs that provide them with partial funding for accomplishing this type of habitat restoration. So we're piggybacking on that. Audubon, California planted seedlings on land around a filtration pond where Rominger couldn't seed any crops. This is what we call a non-crop area. And for a farmer, a non-crop area, you can't make any money off of it necessarily, and you end up spending money. You know, it used to be historically, you're always over here disking or spraying, controlling the noxious weeds. Now we see a great opportunity. Let's plant some beneficial plants here 
that will cover the ground, that will provide habitat to all kinds of wildlife, including the native pollinators. The idea is to plant things that flower at different times of the year, so that bees have a reason to visit the field over and over. Here's a coyote brush. Yep. Coyote brush is the one that's really, really good in the fall, uh, flowers in the fall. Another neat thing is this is just going to be a gorgeous spot someday, too. Yeah. It's all these trees and shrubs growing up and native grasses. There's the one day, the plants in this field will be as tall as the ones at the Xerces Society's nearby experimental center. When that happens, the hope is that they'll provide habitats to honeybees and dozens of native bees. Although the threat of a new episode of colony collapse disorder remains, researchers and farmers are optimistic that by breeding a better honeybee and attracting native bees, they'll be better able to solve the problem.